Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Psychology of Business podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brandon Griffin, and joining me in my virtual studio is Sarah Weissman. How are you doing today, Sarah? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me here. Well, it's great to have you here. So I subscribe to a couple higher education um, focused newsletters and a story came into my inbox that was really fascinating to me. So this one was on micro credentials and I read it and I thought it was great. It's from Inside Higher Ed. And I looked at the author and it said, Sarah Weisman. So I reached out to Sarah and I said, hey, I run this podcast. I'd be interested in talking about it a little bit more. Would you like to have a conversation about it? And luckily, Sarah said yes. So Sarah, would you like to introduce yourself? Tell our audience a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. I'm a reporter at Inside Higher Ed, and I cover a whole gamut of things. Um, my main focus is community colleges, minority serving institutions. I also focus on sort of anyone you would categorize as a non-traditional student or maybe a post-traditional student in the way that our, our world is going. Um, so I'm spending a lot of time talking to adult learners, student parents, first generation students, low income students. Um, so that's really um, what I'm primarily focused on and the institutions that are serving them and how good a job they're doing at doing that. And my other kind of side beat is I also cover um, religiously affiliated institutions and any kind of intersection between religion and higher ed. Um, and it's a very fun job. I really love it. So what is your background? Is it in higher education, journalism, communications? What's your academic background? Yeah, I mean, in, in a way, higher education journalism was a very happy accident. Um, I knew I wanted to go into a journalism for a very long time, um, as early as my, my high school newspaper days. Um, and I went to graduate school for journalism at Columbia. And I ended up working on this sort of campus focused story while I was in journalism school. I was um, following around a, a campus chaplain, one of the first Shia Muslim campus chaplains in the United States and writing about some of the work he was doing on sort of pluralism within his, um, his campus organization. And um, I ended up really loving talking to students. Um, I was really interested in you know, the fact that they were making such big sort of life choices in that moment, they were in the middle of thinking about who they were and what they wanted to do. And I became really interested in sort of the structures that were supporting them in that. Um, so, so yeah, started with the journalism background, um, sort of sidled my way into the higher ed piece. And uh, it's it's been a great journey. I'm glad to hear that. So you mentioned that students, 18, 19, 20 year old students are making these big and often costly financial decisions that are gonna impact the rest of their life. So this is why I think people are starting to get more and more interested in micro-credentials. Could you tell us what a micro-credential is and how that differs from maybe the traditional education framework that we have set up in the United States? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the, the most interesting things about micro-credentials is, is how amorphous and sort of borderless the term really is. Um, so it's often used to refer to kind of any program, um, post high school job training that's shorter than your typical two year or four year degree. Um, so that can range from, you know, a digital badge that you earn on LinkedIn learning to a certificate program you take at a community college to a boot camp certificate. It really um, is very wide ranging. Okay, so traditional education, you're going to you're going to get a two year degree, a four year degree, but these micro credentials, why are people pursuing them? Is there um, benefit to them? Is it just that they're cheaper than regular degrees? Are people getting jobs out of these? Could you give us some examples of micro credentials that people are actually getting? Yeah, definitely. So for this project, which I did through an Education Writers Association fellowship, I ended up talking to a, a little over 50 students about you know, why they were choosing these pathways. What was it about these kinds of programs that were appealing to them either, you know, over traditional degrees or as kind of the first step toward eventually, you know, taking on a degree later on. Um, and I heard a lot of different things. I think there, there were different kinds of students who, who found these kinds of programs attractive. Um, you know, for example, I, 
spent some time at Marcy Lab School in Brooklyn. It's an unaccredited um, one-year fellowship in software engineering. I mean, a lot of students told me they were there because they didn't want to spend money on general education courses when they felt like they could do something that was more direct, that, you know, was only the classes that were focused on their particular job path. They weren't interested in, you know, going into debt and having to take a literature class if they didn't want to. Um, and that was sort of a driving force for some of them. I think for some students, they never really considered a degree. They were kids who, or adults who, you know, saw themselves in the trades, who liked hands-on work and just sort of felt like these short pathways were were the best option for them and again, the most direct. And, and you also met, I met a lot of adult learners and, and some younger students as well, who really just felt like a degree wasn't feasible. It was too expensive at the time. It was, they had kids, they had other responsibilities and they couldn't imagine sort of just getting through the time it would take to do a two year program at that point in their life. So something that was, you know, let's say a nine month dental assistant certificate program. Um, I met a student who wanted to be a dentist later on, but right now that's what felt feasible for her. Um, so really there was a, a wide variety of stories. I really like the idea of micro credentials because I think having either a skill or a job or a trade, something's explicitly tied to a learning outcome is very desirable for people, just like you, you expressed. But as someone who works in higher education, I think there's going to be a challenge of translating that. And I think um, you've probably seen good examples and maybe not as good examples of universities implementing this. But what challenges or maybe opportunities that do you see micro credentials having to the traditional educational environment of colleges and universities? Yeah, that's a really good question. It, it makes me think of um, I recently wrote a story about um, some comments by Kamala Harris about non-degree pathways and needing sort of route to the middle class that weren't necessarily um, your typical college degree. And I spoke with, you know, some higher education lobbyists about how they felt about that, if they felt like that was a tradition, uh, sorry, uh, a sort of um, an affront to traditional higher education or, you know, how, how they were kind of perceiving that rhetoric that that there are other options that there should be other options and, and what some of them told me is that they they you know they really did see it as an opportunity they you know they're in the business of education they're in the business of of training students for jobs and you know if these are the kinds of programs that that students want they're they're you know exploring that um so i think that that while there's a certain amount of kind of fear in traditional higher ed about the extent to which today's students are questioning the value or questioning, you know, whether they should go to college at all. Um, I think there is a lot of kind of openness to, to exploring, you know, different modes and platforms that maybe students are, are more interested in than they used to be. One benefit of higher education, personally, I think when people graduate high school, it's it's almost natural that you're going to go to college or, or you're going to do something else. Do you think micro credentials are going to have an impact on maybe the let, let me put this another way. When, when you go to college, you have a structure, you, you have dorms that you live in, you have sports games, you have different activities that you're going to with micro credentials, that structure is going to be a little bit different. Do you think micro credentials are going to be popular with all different types of students or do you think it's going to cater to a specific um type of learner yeah that's a that's a really good question i mean i think micro credentials have historically really appealed to your learner who has a lot else sort of going on in their life um they have family caretaking responsibilities they work jobs um these sort of shorter faster options which also i think can tend to be sort of more flexible, um, given that this is usually their student body. Um, I, I think those students are really attracted to micro credentials. And those aren't necessarily the students who are typically going to be, you know, living in the dorms anyways, and kind of having that, um, you know, what we think of as the, the kind of quote unquote college experience. Um, so I think I think micro credentials sort of appeal to, to that student who is trying to fit 
they're they're learning into to just so many other responsibilities that they're juggling. That's a really good point. That's something that that makes sense. So with micro credentials, they're um, people who maybe aren't these traditional learners. Have you seen an impact on econ economic mobility? Have you seen this impact um, people's ability to attain better jobs and earn more money? That's kind of the the interesting thing and and sort of the challenge about micro credentials is that we have a ton of data about you know the earning premiums of degrees. We have significantly less comprehensive data about sort of what a micro credential really gets you. And, and admittedly, the, the data that we do have is kind of mixed. Um, you know, for example, for certificate programs, you know, the studies that exist generally show the probability of your employment is higher. Um, there is an earnings boost, but those sort of positive effects can kind of wane after a few years. Students don't always know that, you know, they might get this certificate and get a wage boost, but to get the next wage boost, they have to do another certificate or they need to, to kind of continue their, their educational journey. Um, there's also kind of different results for different kinds of micro-credentials, like certificate programs that are, you know, really targeted to a specific career like healthcare um, tend to show, you know, better outcomes in the labor market than, than those that offer more general skills. So I think we're still really figuring out, I think there's a lot of potential for economic mobility based on sort of how these programs are designed. Um, but at the same time, there's a real worry that you don't want students taking paths that um, aren't necessarily going to live up to the hopes that they've they've put into these programs. I like that last line you said, students are going to get are going to get into these programs that don't live up to their expectations. So because the boundaries of what is and what is not a micro credential is so loose, and maybe because there isn't one regulatory body that is accrediting this, what issues do you see with people taking a micro credential that doesn't actually pan out? Is that something that you explored in that article? Yeah, it is. It is something something we explored. I mean, Mostly I was talking to students who were beginning or in the middle of these programs. And, you know, they certainly are looking at them as, as vehicles for economic mobility, as, um, you know, opportunities to, to really advance for, for them and their families. Um, and I think, and I think the, the, the next story I think should probably be, you know, focused on alumni, you know, talking to students or former students about, you know, what they, they really got out of these programs. And I think it really, really depends on, on, you know, who that student is and, and what kind of program they did. And there are certainly people who are working on creating, you know, quality frameworks and structures and ways that these programs can, you know, signal their quality to students or prove their quality. Um, and I think also a group that I, I talked to for this particular story was, some high school guidance counselors, and I think they're getting more savvy about, you know, helping students navigate non-degree options. Um, you know, even high schools that used to really only present college as as sort of the the best next step are are making some real efforts to to sort of guide students through through their choices in a more expansive way, um, which can be helpful. But I think that also. Um, it's still a challenge for adult learners who don't have that kind of guidance, who are really, you know, choosing programs by going online or going on social media and really kind of doing research on their own. So um, it, it'll be interesting to see what kinds of resources develop for them. I think that will be really interesting. In, in your study of micro-credentials, did you find anything alarming or anything that's maybe issues you see with the general trend of people taking more and more micro-credential courses? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, just to, to kind of speak um, anecdotally about sort of the emotional side, I, you know, I talk to a lot of students who, who just really, I keep, keep coming back to the word hope, but really just placed so much faith in these programs. You know, they were, I talked to students who saw these programs as potential routes out of poverty, homelessness, um, you know, people who hope to kind of raise their kids on on the salaries that they felt that they would make afterwards. Um, 
And yeah, and I think every time I talk to one of those students, I, I, you know, you're hit with the question of, you know, is this going to pan out for them? And I think for some, it will. And I think for, for some, it won't, at least without further education. And, and that's, um, that's something I think micro-credential providers in higher ed is going to have to to really reckon with. Yeah. So would a micro-credential, uh, would, would Harvard EDX, I think that's what their platform's called, would that count as a micro-credential? Are you, are you familiar with that? That's a good question. I'm, I'm not so familiar. Are, do they provide certificates or, or some kind of... I think I think they provide cer- certificates, yes. I think you can do... I think they have a, a lot, but you'd essentially take you know, three or four courses. It's not through um, the institution or the brick and mortar Harvard, but I think they have Harvard professors, almost like a secondary type of course that they're uh, teaching. But, um, you know, you pay 50, 100, sometimes a couple hundred dollars, but you can get a certificate in data analytics or something like that. Because I'm a business professor, so a lot of my stuff reflects business. So maybe you do one in marketing, something having to do with data analytics, something to do with leadership or management. But it's it comes from Harvard, but it's Harvard EDX. So it almost borrows some of that prestige, but applies it to this micro-credential. Yeah, I mean, that 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 definitely sounds like a micro-credential. And I feel like more, more and more universities are starting to kind of step into that, which is interesting because I think community colleges used to be sort of the ones primarily offering these shorter programs. And I think four-year institutions kind of see that this is, you know, this is trending and, and worth their time. And have you seen more and more universities do this? Do you think more colleges and schools are going to implement this? They're going to start doing more micro credentials? Yeah, I, I absolutely do. I mean, I think I think we're starting to see that that trend already um, that they're, you know, starting to to be more aware of these programs, think about these programs. Um, also, you know, certainly an extra revenue stream. Um, and, you know, at a time when when a lot of universities are facing maybe not the Harvards of the world, but there's, you know, certainly a problem with a, a demographic cliff. There's less and less sort of traditional age students um, flowing into a lot of colleges and universities, depending on the state. And and I think universities are having to be a little creative and and look at other options and, and think about how to kind of um, attract students who, who might not have considered them before. That's a really good thing to point out. As someone who works in higher education, I think the idea of a Democrat, demographic cliffs, excuse me, um, micro-credentials, these are all things that are exciting, but they're also things that could maybe threaten our industry that we work in. And I'm not sure exactly where you stand on this, but do, are, do you see micro-credentials eventually taking the place of a traditional higher education? What do you think is going to happen? Is there going to be some overall shift? Or is this the question that everyone's trying to answer regarding where the future of higher education is going to go? I mean, this might be the kind of traditionalist in me, but I, I I, don't think the degree is going anywhere. I think, you know, you look at all the research, it's still kind of the, the surest path to a, a well-paying job. And, and even as more employers and even state governments have have stopped requiring degrees. Still, the majority of jobs that are going to make you kind of, uh, um, let's say, middle class wage are are going to require a degree. I also think micro credentials aren't necessarily um, to the exclusion of degrees. A lot of work is going into making them stackable so that um, you know certificates can build on each other and eventually sort of provide credits toward a degree. And I think certainly there are students who are interested in that. Um, they don't always know how it works and, and there needs to be sort of better communication around it. But um, that's certainly a developing area in the field. Um, and I think there are students who, you know, who are still going to want that kind of classic, you know, quote unquote college experience, um, you know, even as, as there's this you know, move towards other things and, and these doubts about, you know, some of what that experience gets you. That, that makes me happy because I, I, I personally do think that there's value in a traditional education, but obviously um, with the costs of higher education, there's obviously a lot of political conflict on what we should do about that, whether we should go the route of loan forgiveness, whether we should go the route of, you know, the, the, there's a lot of routes that people can take. But 
something that one of my good friends works on is he works on what's called occupational licensing. Have you looked at any of that with regards to micro credentials or education at all? A little bit in, in the process of this project, but not extensively. So he, his name is Dr. Noah Trudeau. He's an economist here at Troy University. I work with him, but I'm friends with him and he publishes a, it's a state by state occupational licensing, um, database, which essentially says for all the different industries, what are the different occupational licenses? And I think traditionally this were put in place um, to say, hey, if you're going to be a doctor, obviously you need a medical degree. But some some states I think have, has taken this very, very far. So um, some states have a lot of occupational um, hurdles that you have to jump through. So I think um, I think that that would be an interesting avenue for future research to see how micro credentials could either help or hinder um, the process of getting a job in states that have more or less occupational licensing requirements. So I think that's something interesting that if you're going to keep working on this, maybe that you should check out. Yeah, that's a that's a really, really interesting point. And it reminds me a little bit of um, part of part of the project is I also, you know, spoke to some employers about sort of how they perceive micro credentials versus degrees in the job market. Um, and I remember talking to an HR person at a hospital and, and something she was saying is, you know, look, the state requires certifications for, for some of these allied mm -hmm. health jobs. I personally don't think that we need it. I would much rather have the freedom to hire people who are uncertified and do our own training. Um, but, but this is sort of what's required. Um, so there's kind of an interesting, it seems, discrepancy sometimes between sort of the speed with which employers want to kind of get people into jobs and and some of the requirements. And I imagine there's probably some similar conversations around occupational licenses. Yeah, well, I think that's a great example. So micro credentials, I think, are a great thing. It sounds like they serve a demographic of people who, for whatever reason, the traditional college experience doesn't work, whether someone can't wait four years, whether they want it for a specific reason, or it sounds like maybe you want to stack it towards getting a degree, which honestly, I think that sounds, if somehow you could package, uh, you know, someone if you could package a set of micro credentials that eventually work towards your bachelor's degree or an associate's degree, I think that would be very attractive. Um, but it sounds like these micro credentials are for a certain type of demographic who the traditional college experience doesn't work. Would you agree with that? Um, would, would, yeah. would you agree with that? I, I mean, I, I think the message I heard, you know, over and over and over from students was, you know, the traditional route just does not work for me right now. And they had a lot of different reasons for why that was the case. Um, but that that messaging sort of came through loud and clear. Um, and I think, you know, that that raises some some interesting questions for for higher ed. Maybe there's there's ways that that sort of the traditional routes could be better serving some of these students. But um but yeah, they're they're looking, they're sort of voting with their feet for for different kinds of options because they they don't feel like a, a degree is sort of the right step or or even a sort of feasible step for them right now. Well, Sarah, good luck with all of your work that you're going to be doing. I think that you come out with great stuff. I hope that you'll join us again soon. But everyone, thank you so much for watching the Psychology of Business podcast. Again, my name is Brandon Griffin. Big thanks to Sarah Weisman for joining us today. You have a great day and happy learning.